Welcome to the Steelers Realm Podcast. Here are the boys of Steelers Realm, New Jersey Dev, JT, and the famous TA. Hey, Steeler Nation. Welcome back to another episode of Steelers Realm Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, JT, along with the famous TA and CJ are with us tonight in an interesting turn of events throughout the day. Uh, before we get into what's up, gentlemen, let's say, uh, say hi to Steelers Nation out there for all those listening in. Well, howdy, Steelers Nation. <laughs> CJ, how was your day today, man? Pittsburgh Pirates. Hey, the Pittsburgh Pirates were competitive for two innings. Two innings. Two. They're out of the, the running already. Heck huh? of a game, though. <laughs> hey, that's one more inning than they've usually been. Uh, yeah. So, hey, guys, real quick, uh, Steelers Realm Podcast is powered by Riverside.fm, the official remote high-definition audio and video conferencing tool of Steelers Realm. Um, interesting turn of events, guys. We had a special guest coming on tonight, uh, former, uh, former tight end for the Steelers and uh, former uh, assistant coach for the Steelers, uh, Jacksonville, Bills, Tennessee Titans, uh, was also the offensive was the offensive coordinator for Steelers, known as Inspector Gadget, none other than probably the most popular person on the internet and social media, Mister M- uh, Coach Mike Malarkey. Unfortunately, with the turn of events today, Mike will not be joining joining us, and uh, we're just going to be off the mic tonight discussing the story that's, uh, as you guys well know, it's playing the plaguing the NFL right now, and that's racism. Uh, and, uh, you know, the team's decision to go against the Rooney Rule, which uh, if you guys have the details on exactly how the Rooney Rule was written, uh, T.A., what's what's the Rooney Rule actually said? I think it was like early 2000s it was put into effect. Yeah, actually, J.T., the Rooney Rule was put into inception back in 2003, and basically, you know, what it basically said stated and and – in a short story, was that every team was required to at least hi- or at least interview one minority during the hiring process for a head coach. And then, of course, as everybody knows, here just last week or the week before, we broke down the winter meetings, what the coaches and owners had discussed in there about revamping the Rooney Rule due to the uh, Brian Flores lawsuit that has basically made headlines now for the last couple of weeks that uh, those changes that were required as far as making sure that they hire at least every NFL team hire at least one woman as an offensive coordinator for the team. And quite frankly, there's been two more added candidates now to the Brian Flores lawsuit and uh, our good friend of the show, Mike Malarkey is now brought into this. Yeah, it's kind of unfortunate. Um, with all this going on, um, just just really unfortunate. And, um, you know, to help through all this, this, this kind of gets settled. And, um, you know, some, some other rules are implemented to help eliminate these issues that they're faced with, the NFL is faced with now. Uh, I hope this goes a long way to uh, enforcing the Rooney Rule. And uh, JT, yeah, before you get going, let, let's at least tell the fans what, what 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 we're talking about here, because the two players or the two coaches now that have added to the list is Ray Horton and Steve Wilkes. Okay, and the reason Ray Horton has now come into play is because of an interview that Mr. Malarkey, coach, had on our podcast a year or so ago when he had talked about some wrongdoings that he got wrapped up in and that he deeply regretted. Now, Ray was one of those assistant coaches in 2016 that was looking to be hired by the Tennessee Titans and also 
Terrell Austin, our defensive coordinator, was looking to be hired as an assistant, or I mean, as a head coach in that 2016 era. So everything keeps coming back to the Steelers. We've got we've got <laughs> we've got a long history with trying to make change and cut through the racism here in the NFL. And unfortunately, that interview, which we'll go, we'll break down, JT. Okay. Is what has sparked Ray Horton jumping into the ring of something that he was unaware of after six years of not knowing why he did not get that job. Well, let's get into it. Uh, CJ, do you have the quote in front of you? Yes, I do. Uh, quote, I allowed myself at one point when I was in Tennessee to get caught up in something that I regret. I still regret it. The ownership there, Amy Adams Strunk and her family came in and told me I was going to be the head coach in 2016 before they went through the Rooney rule. And so I sat there knowing I was the head coach in 2016 as they went through this fake hiring process, knowing a lot of the coaches that were that they were interviewing, knowing how much they prepared to go through those interviews, knowing that everything they could do and they had no chance to go and get that job. And actually, the GM, John Robinson, he was in an interview with me. He had no idea why he is interviewing me that I already have the job. I regret it, and I've regretted that since then. I was the wrong thing. Excuse me. It was the wrong thing to do, and I'm sorry I did that. But it was no, it was not the way to do it. I should have been in, interviewed like everybody else and got hired because of the interview, not early on. So that's probably my biggest regret. It's not hard to do the right thing. It's really not. But you can get caught up in the business. And that's a good point. Is NFL is big business, guys. Let's face it. And even a head coach in the NFL has to feel like a small potato at times. Wouldn't you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean especially when this is your livelihood. Sure. And knowing that this is the big boys club, I mean, you're at the highest level. You're only trying to showcase your talents. And, you know, which is why the Rooney rule was put into effect back in 2003, because it was an unfair, justified system. Now, when Mike went ahead and broke this news to us, you know, as anybody who's listened to this show knows that first and foremost, we're not political. We've already stated numerous times, we're just a bunch of guys, yinzers, in a garage, talking what we love most, our Pittsburgh Steelers. What makes us, what makes them near and dear to our heart, which is honesty, family, togetherness. Rooney's have been tied to, to, African-American players dating clear back to the inception of the Pirates. We were one of the first teams to have an African-American. We even went as far as having an African-American back in 1957 when the league already at that time had a process not to hire African-Americans. We were the ones still doing that. We never seen color, which is why the Rooney rules in effect. Now, to have this man here come out and tell us in a candid interview that this was one of the things that bothered him, JT, and now watching the news kind of twist this in a sense, it's the smoking gun. Oh, the podcast didn't know what they had. No, we knew exactly what we had. We knew that this could have blown up in Mike's face at one time or another. We just didn't expect it to be two years later or a year and a half later for that, for that fact. And the thing that gets me the most is how, depending on where you're listening or who you're reading, you know, we've called Mike now a liar. Mike's not a liar. He's a victim. He was a victim 
of the Rooney Rule. Absolutely. Put in place to protect people. And the thing that he regretted the most is as a leader, as a coach, as a father, to always do what's right. And in that moment, he knew he didn't do the right thing. And it was almost as if he was getting it off his chest. And we were more than happy to let him get it off his chest because as a fan, that is what we want to hear. We want to hear the real story. We don't want to hear the stuff that the media wants to twist, turn, make up, just like what we're doing now. Oh, it's a smoking gun. JT, there's no smoking gun here. We've all known it. Now all they do is they have somebody's words actually in print that's now going to have to follow this lawsuit, which I am all for, and I am so proud of the Pittsburgh Steelers for hiring Brian Flores. I'm even more proud to know that not only do we have Brian Flores, I'm waiting to see Austin Terrell jump in this now. Yeah. Because Austin was part of that interviewing process, JT. And knowing that Mike's going to be there to be able to testify someday, I want to see this. I want to see change. We can't have systematic change unless it starts now. We can talk all we want. But it's never going to happen until we actually do something, JT. Yeah, and let's you know, let's face it. That's that's what we're looking to do. We were just looking to get an inside look at um, you know what players and coaches go through uh, to share with our fans. Just because we're passionate about the game and about the Pittsburgh Steelers and Mike being a big part of them and their history too. So, um, yeah, you know, um, glad that that came out. If it does some good. Uh, it's going to be uncomfortable for a few people for a while, but those who meant right uh, will come out looking well. And, and my big thing here is, you know, all three of us and anyone that's ever uh, interviewed for a job in any sort of fashion, you look at it from, you know, Mike's point of view. Um, <laughs> the guy, the people that are making the decisions come to him. And they say, hey, this job's yours. It's formality, all these other interviews. And deep down, Mike knows, you know, after this, he's set for life. He never has to worry about money again. He never has to worry about the small things in life. All he knows is, you know, he's put all this time and effort in going through the coaching ranks, doing everything that he needs to do the right way right to get to the pinnacle of success an nfl head coaching position and he knows that he's landed this but for the other candidates it's the exact opposite right they've done the right things you know ray horton he's done the right things leading up to this interview right and he thinks he is getting a fair shot to get to that pinnacle of success. And it's not right. It's not right. Because Ray Horton, his, what he has done up until that point before that interview is the exact things you need to do. And for things like that to be slanted, Against him, that sucks. That's not fair. Well, even CJ, when you look, it's let's talk. I mean, we brought this up before. Eric Bieniemy. Why was Eric Bieniemy not even selected as a head coach? This guy has taken his team to the Super Bowl, not once, but twice. He is known as an offensive juggernaut and did not get a fair shake in the NFL this year. Then you look at Mike in his situation. He knew Terrell Austin. He knew Ray Horton. He knew those guys not only professionally but personally. Those were friends. Those were compadres, peers. And he couldn't say a word. He couldn't even celebrate his victory properly because it was already handed to him. He was robbed. I mean, he's almost a victim in this situation as well as Ray and Terrell and everybody else who went ahead and hired or went ahead and interviewed for that. I mean, now we're just talking about this one incident, guys. 
How many other incidences have happened since 2003, since the inception of this rule? And we <laughs> wonder why we have to have an, another meeting about this. Because as a Steeler fan, it's great, first of all, to know that Dan Rooney left behind a reg- uh, legacy for us to say, hey, we want to try to end systemic racism in the NFL. This is no longer the old white man's club. This should be a melting pot. The majority of our players are African Americans. Why aren't the coaches? <laughs> That's the ultimate question. <laughs> NFL can't even answer that. No, because all they're doing is plausible denial. Deny, deny, deny. Tennessee's come out. Denied. Arizona, denied. Denver, denied. The Texans, deny. Everybody is denied, denied, deny. And at the end of the day, this is going to be tied up in law, in, in, in court, and we might not even know if it does go. Yeah, hard to say. I mean, it'd be interesting to see this. We'll definitely we'll have a little bit of skin in this one, as will uh, some others. And one thing, when you look at this and you read this and you think about it, it is a tough, it's a tough subject to talk about. It It, it really is. But... In today's landscape, you know, far too often everyone has a set uh, predisposition in how they look at things and they stick with their guns and they go and they take that, uh, how they feel and how they believe and they go against the other side. I think this is a very open-ended conversation that needs to happen um, just because, you know, since 2010, the amount of minorities as head coaches has gone backwards. And it, it, it doesn't make sense. It, it really doesn't if you think about it. And if you look at the Rooney Rule, I think the Rooney Rule in writing looks good. But far too often, it results in African Americans and minorities getting interviews that are kind of fake, right? To check a box. There's still some, there's, the Rooney Rule was a great idea in 2003. In 2022, it is not the answer. I don't know what the answer is. That is a, an answer and a question that is much bigger than what I have. But having the conversation about it, I think, is very important. Well, it's got to start somewhere. You know what I mean? And, uh, yeah, you know, exactly. hopefully this... Exactly. And I do, I do think, as I said last week, that where the league's going with hiring offensive uh, play-calling assistants and having in having an African-American on your offensive staff is an important thing just based upon where the league is going. It's something that I wanted to say, and I said it last week, it is something that you would like to organically grow, right? And But it hasn't. So they put this rule in, and I think in three to five years, you're going to see organic growth in it because of the rule. So, and and there's a lot of steps that the NFL is taking right now, such as that, that I think is in the right direction. Yeah, but let me ask you something, CJ. Do you think there really is organic growth? I mean, going back. No. Exactly. Which is why the Rooney Rule is here. I mean, in the modern era, Art Shell was the first African-American coach hired for the Los Angeles Raiders or Oakland Raiders or whatever Raiders they were pretending to be at that present time and moment. 
but they were he was the first black coach. Now that was 1989. This is 2022. We are still talking about this. We're talking about it not only in football, we're talking about it in everyday life, we're talking about it in in the protests that have gone on the streets. But at the end of the day, this has to stop. I think all three of us agree on yeah. that. The problem is all three of us don't make <laughs> important enough decisions. Right? right. Well, here, here's an interesting stat. Are you ready for this? There have been 500 head coaches in the NFL history. 24 of them have been black. That's 4.8%. Wow. That's an interesting stat to you. That's why we pay you the big money, buddy. <laughs> it's not just the big money, JT. It's just, you know, it, it's it's trying to get awareness to this instead of all the haters that are out there now. I mean, I've seen it now with, with my, oh, he's only bringing this up because he only lasted a year and he got fired. He's just doing it because he's, you know, spiteful. Yeah, right. Okay. What's Brian Flores' deal? And I think that he's not spiteful. And I think it's, I think that's like I said, it's everyone has a, everyone has an opinion on this, right? And how they go into it, they don't look at anything else other than what they previously believed, and there's no changing that mind. No, you can shove facts down your face, stats, all this doesn't matter. There is a problem, but not enough people want to hear about that problem. So the changes that need to happen actually take place. Yeah. So where do we, we, where do we go from here? I mean, we're going to have to let this, you know, let this play out a little bit. Um, You know, for some comments that we've seen along the way this afternoon, uh, ripping on him, that's, you know, he was just trying to do the right thing. And uh, in the midst of, being caught up in, you know, one of the world's largest money organizations um, has been, uh, you know, kind of like you said, a victim himself of it all and got wrapped right up in the middle of it. And in, in, in to touch JT on, on what you said there a little bit. Yeah. He, he, has taken a little bit of revenge from a very small minority uh, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, whatever. But him saying how he felt, him being honest, him being truthful, and actually, you know, telling that story unprompted. You know, I wasn't a part of the Steelers' realm at that point. Him being honest is going to do more good for a lot of people than uh, the others that just kind of sit back, except there were. Uh, money and go along with it. Yeah. I think Mike, I I really think Mike has made meaningful change in, in a 45 second clip than we've seen in the last 45 years. Yeah. I really mean that. So was he wrong to speak up then? Or was he wrong to not, no, not, I, not say anything no. ever and ever bring it up again? The people in the past that have gone through these interviews and haven't gotten their jobs based on merit and have just been handed them and have not spoken up are the people at fault here. Sure. Oh, I agree with you. And, and to answer your question, you know, the only thing Mike's guilty of is probably not saying something in 2016. But now let's look at the let's look at the global aspect of the world at that time in 2016. Nobody would have believed him. It, this this wasn't even conversation five years ago. And here this weight on this man for three years, JT, for him to go ahead and finally bring it out. Now, how many other coaches are out there? feeling the same thing or how many other coaches got the speech from the white owner 
just be happy you got the job. I just shut up and go do what you got to do, boy. Yeah. Well, yeah. We may never know. Or we may find out, <laughs> like the she is movement, we may find out it could be the he is movement. <laughs> so you never know. Never know. I just hope that it gets fixed, man. You know, for everybody's sake involved. Let's be fair. Well, here's the thing again that I'm hoping that I see. I'm hoping that with the Steeler organization, who first and foremost has been supportive throughout the entire Brian Flores uh, process, because let's face it, that was one of the that's one of the reasons why the Texans are brought into this lawsuit now, because he was a top candidate for the Texans until he said he was going to sue the NFL, and the Texans are like, no, I'm not going to do it now. You know, sticking up for the Texans here a little bit, you know, they've just spent the last two years in media hell because of Deshaun Watson. Did they want to continue that? No. So there's probably a good reason why they did that. Did they do it maliciously? Probably not. But nonetheless, they still did it, which is why they've been named. Now, you got Terrell Austin. Again, candidate, I'm hoping within the next week we see Terrell go ahead and add his name to that list of candidates. Uh, I couldn't agree more. If he went through the process and uh, Ray Horton uh, was a victim, so is he. And I think it speaks volumes that, you know, Tomlin, Tomlin made a quote, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, that he wanted to bring him in um, to keep him close and keep him focused on his end goal, something along those lines. You guys might know exactly more what he said, but I, I think I would like to see that too. And, you know, there's power in numbers, and I think I, I really hope um, and those numbers make a change. Uh, for for the better, because oh god no no finish up. And I was just I, I was just going to say CJ. I think the one thing that we tend to forget because we're the here and the now. This is history. We are part of history in the making. When our kids, our grandkids, look back during this generation. This could be the generation that finally puts an end to all of it. And if the NFL was smart, if they were really, truly smart for once, just admit you're wrong. Have the same type of integrity that Mike Malarkey, Brian Flores, Steve Wilkes has went ahead and shown in their professional career and just admit that you were wrong. Just admit. I mean, last year we seen how many Black Lives Matter, racism, and racism. I mean, the slogans were all over the NFL last year. Just admit you were wrong. Yeah, really. And I and in the build off that they promoted that, right? Absolutely, and made money. There's off nothing of it. wrong let's, with that. Let's not forget. But that. if you're, they made money yeah. off of that too, CJ. If you. It, if, if you're going to preach it, be about then, it. Then live it. Be about it. Exactly. CJ, I found that quote from, from Tomlin, by the way. Uh, when when wondering Please when that. wondering why the, the Steelers hired Flores so quickly, he explained uh, at the NFL's annual meeting that he believed he owed it to Flores to find a, him a job after his success with the Dolphin, Dolphins. And this is a quote from Tomlin. I just didn't want him to feel like he was on an island, told reporters. And then um, also, from a coaching fraternity standpoint, I owe him that. I was in a position to provide that. I think that started our interactions and conversation, end quote. He also said that he, like, further detailed that he didn't know uh, Flores all that well before hiring him, but the two had a phone conversation shor shortly after he was fired and uh, 
when he fell out of the running for the Texans head coaching job as well, too. So that was the scoop behind. I mean, at the end of the day, at, at the end of the day who's that? Uh, Flores is a hell of a coach. Um, I, the Dolphins were, uh, I think, a bigger story with the Dolphins is uh, the allegation that they were tanking. I won't get into that. <laughs> But he, he still, they were, yeah, exactly. Anyway, they were still competitive, yeah. right? He was a hell of a coach in New England under Belichick. And any anytime Belichick takes a shit and a coach pops out, someone hires him. I I, I don't, get, I don't, that's another story for another day, but I don't, I don't get the Brian Flores situation. I don't. Oh, man. Well, guys, it was quite a turn of events this afternoon, too, for those of you Steeler Nation. Um, go out and check out the interview. Just do a search for Mark Malarkey, and you'll find a link to our podcast. And, uh, you, know, you know, let's be honest, guys. Coach was really excited to come on a podcast tonight, and we had big plans to get some inside view on um, – the, the, the entire draft process, both from a player standpoint and then from a coach's standpoint, you know, from the end of the season, everything that goes on behind the scenes up to uh, to draft day and uh, draft weekend. And so, um, you know, we're looking forward to having him back on to finish that conversation at one point in time. But in the meantime, let's hope this uh, let's uh, hope this makes some some uh, waves and uh, make some headway through it all i guess if i could put a a, my kind of final wrap up on it jt i'm not gonna lie i'm disappointed i mean at least oh me too these money hungry news folks could have just waited one more day because as a fan (laughs) i wanted to get inside the nfl draft i wanted to bring it to you the fan steeler nations i mean we had a whole list of things to break down from from the time the season ended to the time the first pick was done and we kind of were robbed from all that. Now, that's my selfish point of view. And, Coach, <laughs> I hope you come back on once this all settles to give us that inside look because I know from a fan's perspective, you know, like we, you and me were talking, JT, you got a 1,000 college players. How do you pick who's number one and who's number 1,000? How do On your you board, judge? yeah. I really wanted to I'm- know – what that process was. Forget about what we hear from Mel Kuyper or the other pundits out there in the NFL, because as we all all the talk, mock they, drafts, th- yeah, right. they damn sure can't pick out who the number one quarterback is going to be. So what <laughs> makes them think that they can rank the rest of the the NFL or the rest of the draft picks? Yeah, so I'm a little disappointed. And coach, <laughs> God bless you. We love you. We're here for you. And, you know, I know you got good family support from Steelers Nation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, well said, T.A. So, well, with that said, I'm sure there'll be more. But um, uh, another bit of kind of breaking news, guys, and I think I shared this with you uh, last night or so. Uh, We have a new sponsor coming on uh, that we're looking forward to uh, uh, their samples they're sending out for us. And looking forward to helping promote those products for you men out there, uh, looking to uh, to polish things up a little bit. Let's just say that. So uh, a little tease with that uh, as well. So uh, with that said, why don't we turn the page here, gentlemen, if you're ready to? Unless CJ, you had kind of a final like uh, exclamation point you wanted to put on that topic before we move on. No, I I was excited to get. Uh... Get a chance to talk to a uh, former NFL head coach. You worry, brother. And I had a bunch of questions. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Um, but I think, <laughs> I think, I really think that uh, for the betterment of everyone, I I understand what took place. And then they, I hope, what you two did uh, in that interview actually makes some yeah. change. Well said. All right. Well, speaking of draft. Um, this week we had linebackers and, uh, uh, what else do you, defensive line? That's right. Defensive line. Man. And we're, we're, we're breaking down the front seven, JT, the front seven. There you That's go. That's where we got to stop the run because Lord knows we didn't do it last year. <laughs> oh my goodness. My goodness. Shit. Um, 
Well, uh, let's see. Who we had on this list uh, before yesterday, because we lost one off the list yesterday, but uh, obviously T.J. Watt, the biggest offseason signing for the Steelers, and uh, probably ever yet. Um, Highsmith, who I thought did a pretty decent job last year. We've got, uh, how do you say his last name? Derek, what's that, T.A.? Tuzeska. <laughs> and uh, we just lost one. Taco uh, parted ways with the Steelers. And uh, who did he go? To, who did he go with? CJ. They just signed him. Yes, was it yet? Doesn't matter. I'm. <laughs> I am with Taco leaving. I am boycotting Taco. <laughs> so that's how upset I am. Uh, yeah, you and then uh, Taco it's, guy, buddy. <laughs> oh, now the taco's gone. Now the, uh, the taco man's gone. Uh, full boycott. On to the next guy. Well, let's be. Give me a Thursday third. <laughs> well, let's be honest. Um, you know, it was slim pickings at one point in time uh, well, for defenders. <laughs> and, and, and to <laughs> answer your question, JT, Taco went to the New Orleans Saints. Okay, that's right. That's right. With, with everything else going on, it just kind of slipped my mind. I didn't have it noted here, too. But uh, who else is there? Oh, we had a signing. Avery, right, from the Eagles? Or the Browns. Which one do you remember? We, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're like the Does Browns are like our farm team. <laughs> they are. Oh, wait, we're getting a quarterback from them, too, so they say. So they say. But that's next week. <laughs> you know, it, We're going to end up with six quarterbacks before the start yeah. of the season. I know. <laughs> We're going to have a full house of quarterbacks. In all seriousness, though, <clears throat> uh, when when you look at this list and you know who's on the roster and all that, you know, outside of TJ and Highsmith, there's not a lot of depth there. And for me, I look at Alex. I'm like. I can see the potential. I've liked him since day one. He's made strides in his first two years, and I fully, I, and I really mean this, I think next year you're going to see someone that comes into camp a little more physically prepared uh, for the rigors of a full NFL season, and I expect him to kind of take that next great leap, if that makes sense. I think um, you're absolutely right. He's shown flashes, but I fully expect him. Damn, damn right, right? <laughs> exactly. What you're talking about, Will? This way. He did not really have a sophomore slump, CJ. I mean, he has progressed a whole lot better than that other guy he replaced, Bud Dupree, ever did. We had to wait five years for Bud to finally yeah. come on strong. How about that? True that. And so I'm excited about him. And, and as far as Tezuka goes... Tezuka. I mean, that kid showed some flashes last year. I'm not talking he's an every down NFL starter, but to come in and spell CJ, I mean, to spell TJ, sorry, CJ, to spell TJ <laughs> and Alex, man, he's got a fresh set of wheels. He can get around that end. I'm, yeah. I, I like where we're sitting there. I'm not quite sure about Avery. And I think we need to draft somebody. I think so, too. But you know what? I, I like what the Steelers are doing. I'm glad they had some money to kind of bolster things uh, before the draft. So we are uh, getting back to Steelers of uh, previous years methodology of drafting for depth and best player available at a position that they have room for as opposed to uh we don't have a uh, we don't have a starting running back so we need to get one we don't have a replacement for um our speedy linebacker uh so let's move up and get one well we we have a little bit of luxury this year i guess in the fact that we can we can, again, help build through the draft, not fill needed holes through the draft. 
Well, and absolutely, and like we've already discussed, Colbert is a kid in a candy store on his way out the door. So, do we pick up one more free agent, JT? Because there's a hot commodity out there right now who had a fantastic year last year. Do we pick him up as a free agent? Oh, you're teasing me. I there. swear to God, if you're talking about Melvin Ingram. <laughs> you're teasing me. CJ, do you know who he's talking about? Is that is that is that who is that who we're talking about? Melvin Ingram. Man, he is out there. He's he's a free agent. You know, we can pick him up from KC. I mean, why not give that guy a try? Oh, wait a minute. We did last year, right? I tell you what. <laughs> Oh, Melvin Ingram. Hey, let's trade him for a sixth-round pick. Why not? And then bring him back. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, we can do it again in 2023. There's no rules against it. This number might not be available this year. I mean, you know, that Melvin Ingram pick really was a great pickup. I'd really like to still know the the behind-the-scenes on that, why he felt he had to leave. You know, I I completely agree with that. Well, we all heard the stories of why they were moving him around. He was promised well, uh, uh, on on the football field. Oh, it's easy. on the football field. They were moving him around. Sometimes he was on the inside, uh, hitting the A and B gaps. It was this is a weird thing. And then next thing you know, Tallman's hitting his quotes, and this guy's getting sent to KC. Yeah, shit. Maybe do it again. <laughs> we can always use another long snapper. <laughs> what was the quote? We need uh, volunteers, not hostages. Something like that. Was that That's it? Exactly right. Yeah. We want you volunteering in the bread line, not being forced to get that crumb of bread. That's right. We had him handcuffed. So he's he's not the option. And if they were to, as <laughs> as said before, this has to be something that needs to fill, be filled in the draft. You could look at someone like a Cameron Thomas. This guy got double teamed, triple teamed at times, and he was still able to you know break through and make an impact. He was a focal point in um, who the offensive needed to stop and he still made an impact someone like him maybe they trade back grab him late in the first round if possible my belief is the sealers will be trading back i've said it multiple times there's so many holes that needs filled in regards to that run defense and it kind of just makes the most sense so who's out there guys I mean, other than, other than Ingram. Well, here's the thing. You know, do we go ahead and take a linebacker in the first round, and especially a Cameron Thomas? I mean, small school, San Diego State. I mean, I do like his tangibles, but I'm not quite sure, man. I want to take a linebacker in the first round. I think we have other holes that need to be fulfilled and would rather get a, a, a late rounder like a Nick Bonanito. I mean, there's a good second round pick, man. Kids out of Oklahoma. He's he's an excellent natural pass rushing. I mean, he plays fast. I mean, this guy coming off the edge, he's got some moves. I mean, he's not polished by any stretch of the imagination, but he's got the skills to be there. And then there's that kid out of Cincinnati, CJ. What do you think about him? So, uh, for him, you know, he's got a good size, which is something the Steelers haven't valued in their prior linebacker picks. I'm looking at you, Devin Bush. <laughs> anyway, I'm, ju- I'm just being honest. One of the things, though, that he could be a solid, you know, starting linebacker. I just don't like him at 20. 
I don't. I'm not thinking. You don't think he'll be there at 20, or you don't like I'm picking him at, at first round? No, I don't. 52? Right. Okay. I'm thinking round three. Third round. And for all of you. We've seen him reach before, though. For all of you. Who, we've seen him reach before with Edmonds. I thought you were going to say Artie Burns. <laughs> well, I don't speak of that man. Well, first of all, as far as my Jay Sanders out of Cincinnati, he's definitely not a first round pick. He's definitely a late rounder. And and by all means, again, I don't see us taking a linebacker in the first round because any linebacker worth his salt is already going to be gone in the, first, in the top 15. CJ, are you right? I think with Miles, yeah, and honestly, I think with the Miles Jack signing. I don't think you see a middle inside linebacker pick, like you said, till round three or round yeah. four. I just don't. Yeah, but we're talking outside. Come on, CJ, get with us now, man. This is outside. We're not talking I inside know. yet. I'm saying I don't. I know that, but I'm saying I don't. <laughs> I don't see them making any any linebacker pick. I think it's going to be D lineman if if they want to. If, like we said, fix the run game, I don't see it. All right. Well, I have some questions. It's going to be D lineman only. I have some questions about that. But, well, let's uh, do we look inside now at our inside situation? Right now. Yeah, you got to do it. Now, I will say uh, this. Of course. If we're going inside, all right, and we do use that number one pick, then it's got to be on Christian Harris out of Alabama. Okay, completely agree. He's he's the only one in that. Um, he's the only one in that kind of uh, frame, fifteen to thirty, who makes sense. It middle linebacker who would be available. But you know the kid who intrigues me the most, and I think his stock is going to dr- rise. And I think he may even go in the first round, even though in years past. He's probably a solid third round all day long. And that's Troy Anderson out of Montana State. This kid can play inside. He can play outside. I mean, he is fast. He can go sideline to sideline. The only knock on him, man, is he didn't play against the competition. But yeah, everything that they talk about, man, the kid's a super smart leader on the field. He could be the green dot guy. Hmm? Poor Devin Bush. Another year without the green so, dot. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry. So, again, I... Please no, continue. No, you're right. <laughs> any shot at... Any, sh- any shot at Mr. Bush, I, I enjoy. <laughs> but in all seriousness... You know, we're going position to position. With Miles Jack coming in, TJ Watt, Highsmith. I don't see I don't see them I just don't see it. Yeah, but now wait a I think they're gonna say, Hey, well, we got our guys, right? Devin Bush, uh, he falls to middle linebacker number two. And we're going to roll with them. And we're going to see what happens. Yeah, but now you're talking. They're going to focus in other areas. CJ, now you're talking about our middle linebacker. No, go ahead. And all we really got is Marcus Allen, Ulysses Gilbert, who, you know, we're still not sure what this kid's going to do. You got Buddy Johnson, who we picked up last year, who I think only hit the field a couple, a handful of times. And then you still got, you know, Robert Spillane. And we've already discussed a hundred times, man. He's a phone booth player. He's stuck in a phone booth. You can't you can't put him out there on passing downs. He's great at stopping the run. He just can't chase a runner. The end of the day, here's the truth. They sunk a lot of draft capital into Devin Bush, right? They're going to give him every chance to fail and every chance to succeed. 
And I hope he succeeds. Yep. I really do. Me too. They're they've declined. They're going to be declining the fifth year option on him. This is a make it but. or break it year for him. Let's face it. Exactly. And they're going to give him every chance to make it. And they don't want to complicate that because they don't want to have to go back to the drawing board and say, you know, we failed here. We, Hey, you've said Artie Burns before, T.A. This is an Artie Burns situation, and hopefully he succeeds in it. Oh, this is worse than Artie Burns. This is like Jermaine Stevens. Ooh. How about a Jarvis Jones? Oh. I'll give you a Jarvis Jones. But, you know, in defense of the Steelers, in all reality, I mean, how hard is it to pick three or four linebackers in the NFL? I mean, let's face it. Me going over here and scouting all these players, you know, most of the time, just like TJ, was a defensive end. He wasn't an outside linebacker. He was a defensive end. Most defensive ends in college relate to the outside linebacker. The outside linebacker relates to the inside linebacker. And even if you are an inside linebacker, doesn't necessarily mean you're a 3-4 inside linebacker. Mm, So in our defensive scheme, it is probably one of the toughest positions to evaluate for our style of defense. No, it's like it's like college basketball where, you know, if you're a power forward in college basketball, you're in the NBA, you're a small forward. It is a great leap. It's a complete difference. Now that goes to do they ever make the change? Because what do you always hear? Great three, four defense. You know, keep it it's <sighs> They never had the personnel, and this is what bothers me with the coaching. <laughs> I know where you're going with this. They they didn't have the linebackers. They didn't have the linebackers that roll out four of them. They never made an adjustment. They just rolled with it and said, "That's what we are." Let's let's, yep, that's who we are and what we're gonna be. And that was my biggest problem last year. I might year. have to disagree with that. And we're going to talk about that next because we're going to move to the D line. But let's face it, in a 3-4, if you don't have a front three, you don't have your four linebackers because your four linebackers depend on that defensive line. And last year, Cam did it all until Loudermilk stepped up to the plate. Yeah, but last year, Tyson all, all, all Tyson was out. <laughs> Two it was out. Two it. All right. So there, there is your most interior defensive line. There's two key players, right, that didn't play. And I was I was tired of watching Cleo Davis go in there and get pancaked by whoever the hell played interior <laughs> offensive <laughs> line for whoever they're playing. It didn't matter who it was. You wonder why the run yet. Yeah. Whoever, it didn't matter who they were playing. Exactly. There was just no adjustment where if may, maybe there was some different thoughts, so on and so forth, but they didn't have that defensive line depth to overcome two injuries and why I'm going to pound as we get in this segment. Why? They need to hammer it in the draft. But all right, well let's so, let's take a look who we got. But right, it's all they why we got linebackers look so bad last year. Oh, true. Right. No, completely agree. They weren't getting the uh, the offensive linemen weren't getting chewed up by our uh, you know our front four. So, um, but obviously Cam, uh, we signed Montrevious. TA. Uh, Great pickup. Alu Alu going to be up to 100% after last year. And is 
to it even indicated whether he's going to play yet. Still not hearing much about that. Hey, he's been at the facility. That much we know. He's been at well, the facility. So. I guess I guess that that's something. something. I'm, I'm so, excited to it to be back. <clears throat> I hope so. I hope uh hope he stayed in shape uh despite everything. Uh and then uh louder milk talked about another guy who I thought did pretty good considering um last year was Wormley. I actually thought he played yeah. well. Yeah. No. No, he's definitely earned a spot for next year, no matter what happens. And then yeah. uh, my man, Henry Mondo. 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 Monsieur Mondo. Uh-huh. Uh, your buddy, Khalil, Carlos Davis. The brothers. Archie Bong. Archie Bong, one hitter. Uh, Demarcus Christmas. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, so, what do we got there to work with? Out of that list, the one cat, cat that I, I want to know more about is Demarcus Christmas. I mean, because he is the one who they have exclusive rights. He's the one they hung on to all season long. He's the one we did not see. What is so special about this cat? Yeah, I don't know. Nobody does. He might be the best kept stealer secret ever. <laughs> there you go. He won't be. Let's be honest. Well, I hope so. I hope he is. If if we're being honest, let, let's just imagine a perfect world. Ta-da! Cam, healthy, better than ever, and a, a, another year older. Montravius. Got another year in the defense, was able, able to come in, take off some double teams off of Cam. Alalu, able to go ahead and spell any position on the front three. To it, comes back mean and hungry and ready to go. Louder milk, looking at building on the success he had last year. And Wormley holding up to why we went ahead and traded a fourth-round draft pick for him from the Ravens. Just those cats alone, do we need more depth? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, but let's um, – we're kind of up against the, the time frame, guys, so if we can kind of get to get to who we got, who's out there, and what you think our thoughts are, let's wrap it up with that. What do you say? So obviously, any free agents out there that <laughs> are uh, under thirty-two years old? <laughs> no, they're all the geriatrics. You know, you okay. got Calais Campbell, Jason Pierre, Paul with only seven fingers, Demonicu Sue. I mean, we can look <laughs> at him going ahead and doing better than Josh Reed and tearing up his sheets. Uh, Carl Nassib, and the only one who's really <laughs> exciting is Larry Ojabunga which I thought did an excellent job for Cincinnati and would be a good fill-in piece. Not quite sure about a story, hey, but a rotational guy is good. Other than that, I don't think there's a huge upgrade of what we have now, JT. So that takes us All to right. the draft. And I'm going to leave this one up to CJ because the number one pick, if he makes it to number 20, should be this guy. If Jordan Davis falls anywhere close to twenty, that's the guy. Is it? it is it? The, up, let's move to fifty-two. Uh, no quarterback. The, no quarterback. Georgia. We're not taking a quarterback. Wait a minute. What do you mean we're not taking a quarterback in roundup? Hey, hey, hey! Save that for next week. Next week is quarterbacks. Well, we will have breaking news on what the Steelers are going to do with their quarterback situation. Breaking news. <laughs> Breaking news. No, anyway. <laughs> Jordan Davis, just an absolute freak. An absolute freak. Sign him. And here's the thing. He's not going to last 20. I can't foresee it. He's going to start getting hyped up as we devalue the quarterbacks in this draft along with the alignment. It's a cyclical process. 
this guy's probably going to end up going like 14. But if he was to somehow fall into right around the range, the Steelers could move up. It would be a no-brainer. It would be a no-brainer. I, I've, I've, this is my guy. Go after him. Figure out a way to do it, because he instantly, as I said last week, he instantly makes the linebackers better, and that's what they need. Why certainly? I, I, I can't, I can't deny any of that. I think out of all the D line, he is the cat to go ahead and get. If does he fall to twenty? Chances are probably not, which means now we're looking at a mid to late round. And the only other guy that I see out there that could do the same thing is the vanilla gorilla, John Ridgeway out of Arkansas. I mean, this cat's three, is 6'6", 327 pounds. I mean, he'll eat up the double teams. He'll plug up that middle. And... When people run his way, they get swallowed up. Now, whether or not, you know, he lasts to the third round, because I think if we don't get him in the in the first round, we got to look at the third round for DL. I'm not saying we spend one on the second round. And then the only other guy who's quite intriguing too, and I think has that good Steelers name, JT, is Otito Ogabongabani. Out of UCLA. <laughs> Dude, I love how your names just continue to get longer and have more syllables as the night goes on. Oh, man. <laughs> Ogbonia. Ogbonia. Is that how you say it? I'm serious, man. Oito. How do you say it? I mean, <laughs> this cat out of UCLA, man, I mean, he's probably looking at like a fifth, sixth, maybe seventh round, man. But... He he's he needs he needs a little he needs a little you know a little loving he needs a little maturing, but dude he delivers a punch like no other man. I mean he yeah. really truly does, but he gets washed up. That's his only problem. He gets washed uh. up. You ever watch him play? But when he's on, the guy's a beast. Good stuff, gentlemen. Thanks for thanks for chiming in. You know much better than I do uh, about those prospects, so I won't profess to be the uh, the mock draft specialist. Mel Kuyper, I am not, so that's why I pay you guys the big money. But you kind of look like him, JT. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it, I guess that's a compliment. I don't know. <laughs> not really. Mel's okay. the guy. <laughs> <laughs> In Steelers Nation, JT looks nothing like him. <laughs> oh, well, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, Mel's much better looking. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, hey, Steeler Nation. Uh, thanks for hanging with us. Lots to talk about tonight, and uh, hopefully we didn't beat that subject into the ground. I'm sure we'll be uh, much more to hear as as time uh, rolls on with this. Hope it comes to a head soon and doesn't disrupt too much um, in the ways of um, opportunities for those applying for them. So, but anyhow, hey, we appreciate you tuning in, gentlemen. Thanks for uh, hanging tough. A Steeler Nation, we, uh, we usually launch this, uh, release it Friday morning. Uh, we're up late tonight a little bit, and it's my fault, so I apologize for that. We kept uh, CJ out at the bar a little too late tonight, uh, but thanks for hanging in there, guys, and <laughs> appreciate you, your input. Gentlemen, uh, good to be with you. CJ, looking forward to catching up on uh, uh, the latest at, uh, in your work, in, in your work uh, place. Uh, anyhow, I'm just rambling. T.A., good to see you, brother. Good to see you back home again. Looks like you were working on the house tonight. Absolutely, man. I've been Bob the Bill. He's always working. He, he is. <laughs> he is. So, anyhow, uh, time to wrap it up. SteelersRealm.com. 
go out to our YouTube channel, just uh, uh, type in Steelers Realm podcast or just Steelers Realm. Uh, you'll find that. And if you're looking for that malarkey uh, interview, uh, you'll find it back there from 2022 uh, down towards the end. I think it's the very first video we posted up on our YouTube channel, wasn't it? September 2020, JT. Ah, there you go. There you go. So, uh, Steeler Nation, careful in the hot tub, man. Looking forward to getting with you next week where we break some news about uh, what the Steelers plan to do with the quarterback position in the draft. And uh, may have a different special guest on. Let's see who uh, this this large gentleman might be coming on to. So I well, know I had to have a little a surprise in store for you. And if we get our supplies from our new sponsor, we'll be looking forward to sharing that with you as well, too. So in the meantime, careful in the hot tub, Steeler Nation. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure as always. Out over Dirch. Careful in the hot tub. We'll see ya. Steelers Nation, thanks for hanging in. For all you new listeners who just jumped aboard to hear what we're about, we're just yinzers in the garage talking what we love. Most importantly, do not be a victim. And please, please keep an open mind when you read everything and hear everything about the latest and greatest. And let's stand behind and support our Steelers family. Good luck, Mr. Flores. Mr. Horton, Mr. Malarkey, and hopefully soon to add to the list, Mr. Austin. Steelers Nation, have a good evening. Say good night, CJ. Good night, JT. Good night, John Boy. Good night, Sue. Bob the Builder. <laughs> good night, CJ. What the hell happened with uh, CJ? Did we lose him? Oh my gosh, we lost him. He bailed. Check back next week into the Steelers Realm podcast.